Okay, we're back. We're live for the four o'clock rock. The four o'clock rock is Think Tech Asia. And it's with Brad Glossman, who's the executive director of uh, Pacific Forum CSIS. Welcome. Thanks. Good to be back, Chuck. Good yeah. to see you. Let's talk about the South China Sea. Oh, yes, let's. I know. So, you know, it's, it's, it's so many things are happening there, and it seems to be kind of an intersection of issues, and everybody's being sort of drawn in. And the question is whether it's overstated or understated or what. So the uh, court in The Hague ruled against the Chinese. They didn't show up. They you know, denied jurisdiction. Um, it, I mean, to the, obvi to the ordinary person, it sure sounded arrogant. Um, and now they're going to disregard the result. Uh, how bad do they look just on those facts alone? The, um, the atmospherics are pretty bad. As, as, as a public relations victory, I would, or as a public relations problem, it's, it's, um, it's nasty. I mean, if you care about public relations. And the Chinese apparently don't. Apparently don't. And I would say, however, that they do. And I think we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more when we get into the solutions to this. Yeah. Well, why why did they do this? I mean, were, were there internal issues? Which or this? Sorry, which this? I mean, uh, well, well, first, you know, pave over some some islands, and second, you know, try to assert some kind of control, and thirdly, you know, reject the court in the Hague. All right. I mean, we don't have a map, a map of, of the Maybe South China Sea. Maybe we will soon. And and I mean, what you end up with is is a a, a the South China Sea, which. As a Chinese admiral said a couple of months ago, it's called the South China Sea for a reason. It's our sea. It's also why the Filipinos call it the West Philippine Sea. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and as silly as that may sound, uh, the, the Chinese actually use that to some degree for the basis of their historic claim. That, they, that this sea has historically been controlled by China, has been part of Chinese sovereign territory. And they have a map with nine or 11 dotted lines that ostensibly identify what the Chinese claim is. Now. That map is a particular issue of itself in the famous U-shaped, uh, the, the tongue, they call it the cow-shaped ta tongue, or the cow tongue, or the, whatever the line is. It's not clear what that relates to. But the fact of the matter is, the court has ruled that that historic claim doesn't, in, while it sounds nice and may be uh, wonderful for, for egos and for national narratives, in le as a legal basis for asserting a claim means nothing. But everybody knew that, right? No, I, I think that there you was think the some... the Chinese really sincerely believe that? I think the Chinese do really sincerely believe that. I think that, you know, and th this addresses a larger set of issues that we can talk about over the next 24, 48 hours as we continue the show, <laughs> which is about the nature, of course, of the Chinese claim to its place in the region. And that is that the Chinese believe, yes, that they are the Middle Kingdom, and that therefore they do have an outsized claim to influence and not only this territory, but the territory that's in dispute with Japan and the East China Sea, and territory that's in dispute with, with Korea further to the north. So, and I think, yes, they would, they would claim that history is on their side and history matters, and that if history does not matter, and that if international law does not take that into account, the problem isn't the Chinese claim, the problem is international law. But they could have made that case. They could have made that case uh, affirmatively. They could have gone to The Hague and, and, and tried to convince the judges, well, all of whom were fair men. Um, uh, you are making assertions in there that the Chinese would challenge every single one. And, and I guess the argument would be that the Chinese would say, no, we have not submitted to the jurisdiction of a tribunal. We do not need to actually challenge or, or have this result. I mean, countries that hold territory typically do not agree to jurisdiction because if there is a genuine basis for a claim, if the court is prepared to hear the case, that means there's a sufficient doubt about where the outcome will go. And if that's the case, why bother? It's yours. And if they're not, if you think you're the stronger party of the two, it makes a heck of a lot more sense for you to just hold on and deny jurisdiction. But they haven't really had control. You know, uh, sure they call it the South China Sea. Sure there was this dotted line, but they haven't physically had control until now. Well, I mean, they've had some control. And I mean, you know, one of the arguments that the Chinese have made, which you sort of alluded to a few minutes ago, is precisely this notion that these territories have been in dispute for the last, well, for a long time. And since the 1970s, the other disputants, and there are five other governments that claim to have, you know, have, have problems either with the Chinese or with others, and that's Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Taiwan, and Brunei. Um, that these governments, various ones, have taken over the islands, have built fishing shacks, that they call them, but in fact look a lot more like that, in some cases built hotels. They've taken tourist trips out there. They have asserted sovereignty, and the Chinese claim is that we're late to the game, that we are, in fact, only now beginning to do what these other countries have done. 
disregarding, of course, the size and scale of the renovation and reclamation activities that the Chinese have done. So, so the argument is, too, mind you again, the Chinese position in this, like so many other things, is we have largely been an observer and an outlier in the creation of the international order, whether we're talking about international law, mm -hmm. international institutions, norms and regulations for behavior. We did not have a say in creating what these rules were. And yes, we have benefited from them, but the fact of the matter is now we're in a position where we believe this order should better reflect our interests. And that's what they are asserting in a variety of different ways, in a variety, the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the rules regarding representation in the World Bank, the IMF, the creation of the, the BRICS, the G20, the working with Russia on, on various issues. It's all about a larger conception of how international order works and feeling that it needs, that this order needs to be reconfigured to better reflect China today and Chinese interests. Stand up China. Yeah. That's what's happening, isn't it? I mean, and everything they're doing, and they're, and they're building aircraft carriers, and they're doing aggressive negotiations. Aircraft uh, carriers. I mean, I'm sorry. This wasn't happening 20 years ago. Um, and in building an aircraft carrier, they joined an elite group of countries like Spain and Italy. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, Spain, Italy, and Thailand. I, 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 who are we to say they can't have an aircraft carrier? And mind you, I was in a meeting a few months ago where a Chinese threw that in my face. Fifteen years ago, one of your Americans told us we can't have an aircraft carrier. Who are we to say who can and can't have we an can't aircraft carrier? We can't say that. Well, no, we can't, but we do. <laughs> what took them 15 years to do, though? <laughs> it did. And, and truthfully, buying or an aircraft carrier, which they did, retrofitting it and sending it out to sea, is not the same as having a functioning aircraft carrier. They're still probably eight, ten years at least away from having it work in the way that it's designed to. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, this... this there's a really basic question here, that, and, and I've framed it in the context of this international order, which is fairly abstract. But if you want to put it in the crudest, simplest form, it would be China, like Russia, believes that it is a great power. And as a great power, it has certain imperial prerogatives. And that is, it gets to be the big dog in the neighborhood. And what that means, in practical terms, is, is that smaller countries on the periphery of China and on Russia do not have complete sovereignty. They do not get to make the decisions that they wish to make, unfettered by an outside country. So the Chinese believe that in a territorial dispute, Chinese interests weigh a little bit heavily, more heavily, just as in Russia, they believe that the Ukrainians don't get to pick which international organizations they're going to be members of. Because they're bigger. And we as Americans have, have called you know this the Monroe Doctrine, and we've argued that we, in fact, get to be the hegemon in, in, in our particular sphere of influence. And the question that we need to be asking is to what degree do we believe that China and Russia are entitled to similar attributes and similar you know, positions relative to the countries near them? Now, mind you, countries like Japan and South Korea to stick to, or the Philippines or any of the other countries in the periphery, we like to believe in that they're democracies and that their size and relative econ of their relative economies uh, isn't a big deal. And so we have to allow them full sovereignty and make the decisions. Mind you, of course, the fact that they are inclined to side with us doesn't weigh into this. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's the essence of the kind of the issue that we're, that, that we're debating. Right it's now. manifest destiny kind of thing, isn't um, it? Yeah, except we're saying that in English. I mean, that's the problem, right? I mean, I'm not sure how you, you Zhongguo, um, I'm not sure what the phrase is in Chinese or Russian, and that's precisely <laughs> the issue. Yeah, I talked to a Chinese national a few days ago about this, and uh, you know, he said, no, it's, we have a historical claim, that's it. Yes. I mean, I think, a lot of people in China buy into this completely. Uh, understandably so. I mean, first of all, because that is what they're taught. I mean, it is, we are looking at this from outside the Chinese frame of reference. And, and I was in a meeting, I, I was running a, a conference in Tokyo about two weeks ago, and I had several Chinese, very articulate, very thoughtful. One, in fact, had a, a PhD from the University of Hawaii. And I find him to be, I, I rarely agree with the endpoints of his conclusion, but the logic to that is, is always impeccable. And I, I, I like disagreeing with this man. And his comment was, you know, we need to avoid selective listening. We have to quit engaging in a conversation with people where we only hear what we're ready to let them say, right? Either they confirm our biases or they agree with us in, in, in the larger set of issues. And it's, it's true. And it, we're doing this, they're doing this to us and we're doing this to them. Yeah.
Now, what about Xi Jinping? I mean, is he motivated to become, you know, to advance this manifest destiny? Uh, has he got some reason to, um, you know, build islands and aircraft carriers and, and take the position that the, the world court uh, has no authority? Well, uh, I, I mean, is something happening in China that makes him do this? Um, of course there is. <laughs> okay. Of course there is. I mean, you, you heard know, it here on right, the Right. Yeah, <laughs> penetrating insights from Pacific Forum CS and Brad Glosser in particular. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I, I don't know Xi Jinping. Uh, what, I'm, what I am... Can, can tell you is the product of study, is the product of perhaps conversations with people that are far better China experts than I, maybe some people that have even been are among his advisors. Uh, I mean, this is a man who, like any national leader, does not rise to the pinnacle of national leadership in any country unless you believe in that country. And he believes in all of the, I think, the enormities of China as a, as a middle kingdom, as a great power, as a country that represents an extraordinarily lengthy history, the embodiment of civilizations, everything, uh, the dreams, aspirations, urges of 1.1 million people, uh, the economic energies of the second largest economy and all of the, con the, 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 the resulting uh, attributes of power that flow with that. He believes in his country and he believes that it deserves to be treated better. But on a political side, uh, does he also believe that he'd be better in better condition politically with the people of China, a billion plus, uh, if he, you know, establishes greater foothold outside the country? I, I'm not sure that there's a, there's not, I don't think that the logic works that way. I think that what he believes is, is that he is asserting Chinese interests both as he sees them and as the majority of people see them. Now, we can ask questions about processes and we can ask difference about means and ends. I think he, like every other Chinese leader, would agree that the notion that China should be the greatest power in Asia, perhaps, a, a, and certainly one of the three great powers in the world, no one would ish, take issue with it. The question is, uh, where do we agree China is, where would this leadership, these, the Mao, Mao era, Deng Xiaoping, uh, the post-Deng era, and Xi Jinping, let's, and I think he represents something of a, um, a, a, a distinction, very much a different sort of leader than Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin. Um, Tougher, more aggressive. Um, yes, but more in the sense that what you'd seen is a move away from charismatic leadership since Deng had left office, and in theory the diffusion of power through the bureaucracy, through technocratic leadership. And instead, since she has come back to office, we're seeing a consolidation of power. So I think that what we would differ is perhaps what is the appropriate characterization of where China is today on that uh, spectrum of power? Where is China in relation to other great powers, the United States in particular, perhaps other regional countries? And then truly, given that, what is the appropriate means to further advance and to advance those interests? I think every Chinese leader, you know, Deng Xiaoping had said, we have these disputes with these countries, we do not have the wisdom to settle them now, let us put that off and for another generation that's smarter than us. And I think what Xi Jinping has said, okay, we're smart enough, or we're strong it's enough. It's time. It's time. It's our time. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, remember the titans, if memory serves. Us. It is our time. You it, know. This is our time. Brad Glossman, it's our time to take a break. And we're going to be right back, back, back after the short break. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Chantelle Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. Now we are on a mission to help young women and girls achieve their dreams and looking forward to sharing with you one episode a month where a young woman or girl will share her dream or ultimate goal with you and hope that we can all get together behind her to achieve that goal. Look forward to seeing you there. Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna and I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I invite you to come watch our show on thinktechhawaii.com. You can also see our shows on YouTube as well, if you can Google search those. I appreciate the time. I hope that you do join us as we learn about education, about the educational system here in Hawaii, what the challenges are, what the benefits are, and how much our kids are learning. So thank you, I hope you join us.
Bingo, we're back with Brad. We're back with Brad, Brad Blossom in Pacific Forum, CSIS, right across the street. And we're talking about China, we're talking about um, decisions and strategies and common sense, uh, making sense of the South China Sea issue. You know, um, how important is this? Do people care? Do people in this country care? Do people in Europe care? I think I know the answer. Do people around the world care? That's a really good question. I, I, you know, interestingly, an hour ago, I was being interviewed by the Beijing correspondent of Der Spiegel, which is the German magazine, trying to make exactly the same case. He, he called me up, say, sort of saying, "We have to convince the Europeans why Asia matters and why why RIMPAC is of significance." I mean, for Americans, I, I think it matters, and I think this is this is probably a point that um, I've made in previous conversations. If not, I should have, and that is that. If you, I mean, I, I presume some of your readers or, or listeners or in the audience has been paying some attention to the uh, Republican convention. And I mean, what are they? I think you're going to assume that. I think you're going to assume it. And, and we're seeing a lot of anger. And I think we're, we're seeing a lot of fear. And I believe and I, I, that at the root of all of this, so much of the anger and the fear and the uncertainty uh, that, that, that is driving decision making, whether it's here, whether it is in Europe, et cetera, is a sense that people, Jay, that look like you and me, white guys with more or less hair than usual, <laughs> but are, are, who are used to deciding the rules of the game are less empowered as in the past. And thus, we are living in a world in which we are no longer assured of our superiority in our place in the hierarchy. And thus, we are trying to come to grips to a world in which we have to actually share decision making with other people that don't, that are women, uh, are not necessarily Caucasian, uh, et cetera. And, and I think all of that together is a, is a great driver of, of this attitude. So yes, we should care because this is the future of the world. It is far more distributed uh, power, far more distributed influence, and, and, and that's the nature of a world that we have to be more comfortable in. And so I think that's why it matters. Um, well. Yeah, it's changing. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree with you, that's what Donald Trump is working off, people being afraid that the U.S. position isn't going to be as good you know, tomorrow as it was before. Make, make America great again, I think. There's a lot of implications to sure. that, but one of them is make America great in, you know, in global power. And we seem to be, we seem to be losing power. Um, except if you actually look at the surveys, uh, you know, there's a Pew survey that came out, the Pew uh, Research Group, which did uh, Deuce is probably the best polling uh, organization in the world. If you look at where we are in terms of American power and respect uh, worldwide, uh, we're doing a heck of a lot better than we did. I mean, the Obama administration, has, despite its ups and downs, has actually seen a, 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 a real crescendo in views of the United States over the past eight years of his administration. I mean, what we're living with in a world in which there are far more complexities to yeah. decision making uh, and, to, and to shaping outcomes, and that, you know, we like to believe in a simpler time when we got to tell everybody, we, the Americans, got to tell everybody what an outcome, how the world would work. And the truth of the matter is, while that's a comforting 1950s view <laughs> of the way the world works, it really wasn't accurate. It, we never got to pick the outcomes of, of uh, uh, in international events. I mean, mind, uh, one word, Vietnam, right? I mean, this little pipsqueak country that managed to defeat us in a war. And, and there are numerous other events um, where we were forced to, um, no matter that we had the largest and most extraordinary military machine in the world, the fact of the matter is, is that we were unable to dictate outcomes in, in, in these events. My belief, as I engage, that the thing that will most consolidate and I think send a message to the world about the ability of the United States to once again lead, and I think our leadership at this point is still very clear. People look to us to get things done in ways that no other country can. And truthfully saying that makes me a little uncomfortable because uh, I, I think that that puts undue burdens upon a, on, on Americans <laughs> in terms of expectations, frankly, yeah, yeah. and what we expect of ourselves as well. Yeah. But I think the most important thing that we could do to genuinely reshape perceptions of American power and influence in the world would be for us to actually start making agreements in Washington and getting some things done. It is precisely... Talking the, about Congress. Uh, pretty much, but, but Congress and the executive. Okay. Yeah, passing a budget, getting rid of sequester. People look at artificial constraints, they see paralysis, they see a quagmire. They see a political system that, by and large, is dysfunctional. The and world when, sees that. Yes. It's not just in this country. It's no, no, everywhere. no. It's, I'm talking about the world. 
It is precisely because they see us unable to make decisions and to act on them and to follow through with them that if a president dares to do something that he will be, or she, will be you know, hemmed in, will be, will be pulled at, will be pulled down, destroyed for peripheral issues, or maybe even non-issues, that they see that as a sign of weakness and a, and a sign of continuing irrelevance. We need to demonstrate that we can, in fact, unite for a national purpose other than a horrific attack on the, on the, on the nation's homeland in ways that allows us to move forward and to, to again, exercise influence. That's a great, you know, aspiration, but uh, it's another show about yeah. whether that Our, can happen, how that life can happen. Or we got to do this again. Let's, let's turn to the Der Spiegel. <clears throat> let's turn to Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked to our correspondent in Brussels on the other day, make that yesterday, and she said, well, people in Europe are not following this. They don't care. I think that's right. Um, and, and so, that, you know, that means that the stage, this is all on a stage, kind of a world stage. Mm -hmm. that, uh, the stage uh, doesn't reach them. Uh, and for that matter, it doesn't reach a lot of people in this country either. So we, we have the, the diplomats and the State Department guys mm -hmm. who are really interested in this. but but. But the world isn't interested, and the world is not going to tolerate the use of force. The world is not going to allow a big argument here, is it? Well, I, I, I can take issue with Go ahead. practically every clause in this. No, I mean, <laughs> only because, I mean, the world does take issue with this, because if you again look at what's going on in, in the political discourse in this country, make America great again, that's about bending the world to our will. Yes. Right? You know, and that, that is about economic development, although wait a minute, Let's see, our, our, our unemployment rate is down to below 5%. We're actually growing pretty well. The debt's been shrinking. <laughs> I mean, the economy's doing pretty well. I mean, most people look at the numbers. They talk about their own individual circumstances, and they seem to be fairly optimistic, yet the country's headed in the wrong direction. Um, so there's this weird disconnect, and at the same time, a disconnect between the fact that, in fact, they're complaining about trade. So Asia does matter to them. I except then it doesn't. They don't see it. That's right. the problem. And so, I mean, and that's among Americans. If we want to talk about Europe, I mean, you, you, I'm sorry, look, continue your, your riff on, on forces to be used, except Mr. Putin sent his little green men into Crimea. He sent them into the Ukraine. You've got a fairly forcible, I mean, we still, now we've suspended the deployment or the, the, the withdrawal of forces from Iraq, probably doing the same with Afghanistan. I mean, there are still attempts to deploy forces and to use them in ways that would, you know, right now, I mean, what is the, the, the Trump message? We're not respected, we're not strong enough. It's pounding the table about doing, you know, things that seem to be assertions of national power, whether they're legal or not, it's another matter. But my point is, is that people still seem in the abstract to favor that. So, I, again... Okay, it's great. Let me go to this, though. Okay. <clears throat> I make you Secretary of State. <clears throat> Actually, I think you should have been Secretary of State a long time ago, Brad. Um, I make you Secretary of State in the next administration coming soon. Uh, and, I, and again, I'll say, as I said earlier, in which case there will be a rush of people to move to New Zealand. <laughs> but that's, uh... what, do you, what do you recommend to the president, whoever he or she may be? Um, that's a really good question because, again, to me, the questions of American resolve really need to be are demonstrated by affirmative action in, in, in you know, the bank shots, right? They have to do with Americans mustering the political will, demonstrating a, an agreement and sense of purpose, and, and for all of the frustrations and passions that are being, that are, that are in play in the election t this year, I am not convinced and I do not believe that the outcome of this election will lance any of those boils. I mean, I think yeah. that they will all fester for at least another four years. So yeah. we have a problem there. So put that aside. I would argue that what we need to be doing, of course, is demonstrating American uh, capacity to lead and lead in, in ways that, that and lead in ways that are leadership. Uh, we need to be putting together domestic coalitions, or, or I'm sorry, international coalitions, diplomatic coalitions that address problems. So let's let's focus on the South China Sea. What it means is that we need to be getting all of the countries that are both directly and indirectly affected by this decision to call out to to, to demand a respect for the rule of law, respect for the tribunal. Um, we need to have preferably organizations like ASEAN, which, uh, frankly, while it is largely impacted, has yet to demonstrate the solidarity and, and unity of purpose to make a statement against this. Yeah, so uh, that too has, bad. That doesn't speak it doesn't well of ASEAN. It doesn't surprise anyone. And I mean, the truth of the matter is that you have countries that have, by and large, probably been bought by Chinese interests. But that's yeah. a fact of life. Yeah. So you would like to have the demonstration of solidarity there. 
you would like to see, I think, uh, other organizations, the EU, come forward as well and, and demonstrate. So, so I think you have the diplomatic front. Obviously, this is a very contentious statement, but I think that the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the trade deal, it needs to be, I, 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 it needs to be passed. It needs to be passed uh, because Europe, or Europeans, Asians look to the United States and really see this more importantly than anything else is a demonstration of commitment to the region. I was in a meeting in Singapore a few weeks ago and asked, what is it that you want us to do in the South China Sea? How is it that we will demonstrate our, our commitment, our credibility, that you will be guaranteed that the Americans are in this for the long run? And they said, forget the South China Sea, pass TPP. That shows us that you're committed to this region, to leadership, et cetera. And, and that's not a popular answer. Um, and obviously, that ties into the political piece because the, what, what's happened on the economic side is we've been really good about making it easy for people with money to move capital and we have not done a damn thing for all the workers that are dispossessed. We need to pay real attention to handling the, 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 the negative effects of these trade deals. And the final thing, counterintuitively of all this, once we've amassed this incredible front against the Chinese and we have a wall of diplomatic indignation and demands for respect for the rule of law, we back off. We've got to give the Chinese some space to, have, to be able to work out in a way that saves face, that allows them to claim a victory, that they can find the win-win solution that Beijing says it wants to do with its neighbors. What, what do you mean back off? I mean, what is that, just let go? No, okay. I mean, well, I think what it means is, is that you don't try to force the Chinese into a corner. Admit the ruling was, was, was a, 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 a that, that you lost. Admit that it was a mistake. Don't, you know, save face, as, as, as the saying would go. And there's a diplomatic formula for this that needs to be worked out, primarily between Manila and Beijing. And what it would just consist of is providing the Chinese the opportunity to negotiate over joint development that allows them to pull back, that allows them to claim that they have not been defeated, that they can claim victory in some way, that they advance their national interest, that they will then serve well the Chinese people and, the China, and, and China as a country, and yet not look as though they have been beaten by well, the West again. We talked to um, Michael Davis, who is a law professor at Hong Kong University, <clears throat> teaches international law, wrote an article about this in, uh, in the South China Morning Post. Mm -hmm. And what he said was, this is a great time to treat the whole confluence as a platform for negotiation. Sure. Um, of course, you know, um, uh, how you negotiate that, what you say, what arguments you make in the negotiation, is, that's complicated. Uh, but what do you think about that? Put them all together in a room. I, I would like to make that to think that that would work. That it works for us. But the Chinese position is is that these these disputes all need to be resolved bilaterally because that in fact positions China in every dispute the Chinese are the greater power and the, the yeah, smaller sure. country. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's a it's a political reality. So you have to. I think you you there's a, another set of negotiations about a code of conduct in the South China Sea, which have been underway for over well, about 20 years probably. And you had in 2002 a declaration on a code of conduct. And since then, the move was to create this code and it's been stalled. And every time there's a problem where the Chinese look to be beaten up internationally, they kind of create some new momentum. I think the trick would be to create the momentum, the multilateral discussion that you're talking about needs to be about the COC, this code of conduct. That you pursue, but that's a broad set of principles to govern the way countries react. The particular bilateral disputes have to get handled, frankly, one-on-one -on -one with China and X, Y, and Z. And hopefully you have the principles from the code of conduct informing the larger, the, the smaller, more discrete negotiations and the Chinese recognizing that it is in fact in their national interest to forge deals that genuinely do constitute win-win solutions for both sides. Yeah. So behind the scenes, it's multilateral, but out in front, it's bilateral. Yeah, um, it, it's a multi-layered game. Yeah. Complicated. We live in uh, complicated and changing times. That's why you and I are always going to be in business. When I, you know, what I get out of this, though, is you wake up in the morning, America, and you look in the mirror, and you see China, and China is looking back at you. That's, that's creepy on just so many different levels, Jay. I'm, uh, uh, I look in the mirror in the morning and I just see me and that's, that's, that's enough to get me motivated for the Oh day. my God. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. I suppose Whoa. it would be. Whoa. That's Brad Glossman. Uh, he's uh, the executive director of uh, uh, Pacific Forum, CSIS, and uh, honors us to join us and talk about the South China Sea. There'll be more. Thank you, Brad. Always a pleasure, Jay. Thanks for having me. Aloha.